Hello everyone, today is Thursday, April 19th, 2018, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for coming this week. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here, and I'm humbled by your presence. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions as usual, your questions on trading. If you don't mind with the questions, keep them relative to the slides and or comments relative to the slides. And then when we get to the live charts, uh, or I should say hold off on your stock picks until we get to the live charts. And that's for your benefit. And if you don't mind, also for your benefit, ask about one stock at a time. All right, what's this week's focus? Well, this week's focus is going to be 17 secrets to trading. And I'll explain how I came up with that in just a second. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up, all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen now. And then I stole that line from Greg Morris. Now, to those of you who have known me for a while, I'm going to do a little dead horse beating. And that's for a variety of reasons. It's one, it's, it's like the uh, preacher I think it was Anthony Robbins mentioned once that kept giving the same sermon. And after the sermon, somebody came up afterwards and said, ah, I can't help but notice there, Pastor, you're sort of repeating yourself. He says, oh, I'm glad you noticed. And I'm going to keep repeating myself until you people get it. So that's a little bit of why I'm doing this presentation this week. I also have, uh, I haven't done a lot of trading psychology in the last few weeks because of the developing market conditions. And we're still going to get to the market conditions. But I think everything I talked about the last couple of weeks, if you go in and watch those shows, will still be relevant to the current conditions. So go in and do that as you have time. And But this week, I was going through my back end of my website, and I found an article, Seven Secrets of uh, Let me rewind that. Seven Secrets of Trading. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. I'm going to put that as part of the learning management system that I'm developing on the back end. And then I went down a little further and I found 17 secrets of trading. So I've been morphing those two together. And I thought now would be a good time to present on this. And then also it would be something good for me to capture to go into that learning management system. So let's get into that. So let's talk about the 17 secrets to trading well the number one secret to trading and this is something that i wish someone would have told me 30 years ago the number one secret is there is no secret to trading now the marketers will have you believe that you can print money every day i've been getting some emails lately from one person in in particular, and they're like, hey, we just made $30,000. It's not even 10 a.m. And then I got these emails for a few days in a row, and now I notice they kind of dried up for a while. So it's got me wondering, are they still printing money every day, or what's going on? Also, you have to ask yourself the question of repeatability. Repeatability means that you did something phenomenal and you could do that again. Or even if you have some sort of trading system that you're following that other people can follow along too. And the example I often give here is if somebody's got a day trading system, by the time they're getting, by the time you get in, they're already getting out. And it could be quite frustrating trying to follow someone. But the main thing I'm talking about here is these careers that were launched by maybe one market call. Just one market call launches an entire career. There was a few people who called the top in 1987 ahead of time. And then a 30-something year career was launched from that day forward. Well, they've done a miserable job, failed miserably in calling any top ever since. I guess predict early and often. As I often talk about, I was up close and personal with a good friend of mine who turned about $5,000 of questionable origin, which I found out after the fact, by the way, 
I realized I used to tell the stories like, well, that sounds like I'm uh, in, in cahoots with someone who's not so good. Anyway, he turned it into roughly a million dollars. I saw a statement at 975. I don't know how much intraday it was more than that or less than that, but roughly a million dollars, close enough for government work. And when he was getting close to a million, I suggested he cash out. And if he was that good, keep out 100K, rinse and repeat, do it again if he's that good. And put the other 900K or whatever it was into some sort of fixed income investment. So at least he'd have a little income. And that was 20 something years ago. Back then, a million dollars was still a million dollars. And he said, I'm not going to take financial advice from you. Now, he's no longer on this earth, and that's a two drink minimum story. But the point is that he couldn't rinse and repeat. And I hope that he could. I hope that he did have something magical, something I could learn from him. And what I saw was taking an ungodly amount of risk, make $100,000 on options, and then plow it right back into the market, buying some way out of the money calls, and then having those go way in the money, and then rinsing and repeat. Now, eventually, it ended badly for him. And as I said, ended up with a round trip. So repeatability is very, very important. And I'm always saying a lot of things like when I teach my trading system and all, it's like, okay, just in case I get hit by a beer truck, this is what you need to know. And also, uh, along those lines, if somebody has a proprietary method, you'll never know whether you're doing the right thing or not. So the bottom line is you don't want to beat yourself up. And this is something that I say quite often, but I think it's, it bears repeating. No one knows exactly what a market will do. Not you, not me, and certainly not the guy who screams on TV. Now, if you think about it, this is very, very, very liberating. It means that even the small guy has a chance. And as I often write, you'll see some big guys, not that I'm being shot on Friday, taking pleasure in someone else's pain, but you'll see that occasionally these big boys make a huge mistake, like the Ackman debacle. I know I kind of obsess over that, but this gentleman lost $4 billion fighting the trend. And he might have, if he'd cashed out a little bit earlier, he might have actually made a billion dollars. He certainly would have made quite a bit because he bought with the trend initially. So the bottom line is nobody knows, but that's good. That means that the small private trader can compete and in some cases we have an advantage we could buy a little ipo a little thin ipo or we might be able to buy some sort of small cap stock that a fund manager can't buy i have rias on my trading service and every now and then they'll say hey dave i love that little ipo that tiny little stock you recommended however i could not take that for my clients because it was too thin and they congratulate me because it worked it doesn't always work obviously but they congratulate me and it's a good feeling that hey you know what sometimes we do have an advantage now the second secret is that you don't have to be a brainiac average intelligence is enough in a lot of cases the smarter you are the more difficult it will be for you. And William Eckert had a wonderful quote here. I haven't seen much correlation between good trading and intelligence. Many outstanding intelligent people are horrible traders. Average intelligence is enough. Beyond that, emotional makeup is important. If I have a kid come to me, as I've had on a couple of occasions, and say, Mr. Dave, can you help me with my stock picking contest? And I'm like, yes, do this, this, and this. Okay. And they go off and do it. And quite often they do very well, as I've written about quite a bit. But if someone else comes to me who has a, an advanced degree or it's graduated college or is a doctor, a lawyer, or automatic transmission mechanic, I try to tell them what to do. I get faced with a lot of why, 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 and what if this, and and 
what happens with the news and et cetera, et cetera. So I really think that average intelligence is enough. And the smarter you are, the more difficult it's going to be. Now, joining the American Association of Professional Tactical Analysts has reaffirmed that there is no holy grail. And some of the people in this organization run millions and even billions of dollars. And these are some of the brightest minds in the industry. And two things. One, I'm, I'm amazed at how open they are with everyone else, as am I. And number two, I think that if there was a holy grail, one of these guys would have found it by now. So attitude is more important than aptitude. And that's a reoccurring theme. How you feel about the markets and how you're willing to be, as I often say, kind of flippant in whatever happens. Whatever happens, happens. A market will do whatever it wants to do, regardless of what you think it should do or how you feel about it. As I often say, the distance between you and your success is the distance between your ears. And the biggest mistake that I see people make is the failure to realize that they know they're making a mistake and they do it anyway. So I think if I had to boil down trading psychology into a few words, I would quote Jesse Livermore by saying a stock speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows that he is making them. Have you ever violated your plan? I'm raising my hand. Raise your hand if you have. Have you ever traded in less than ideal conditions? If you're a trend trader and you're placing a lot of trades over the last couple of months, or you have placed a lot of trades over the last couple of months, then you are placing unnecessary trades. You probably shouldn't have made those trades. If you are a position trader and you are day trading, then you are violating your plan. You're making mistakes and you know that you're making them. Have you ever not honored your stop and the market blew right through it and kept on going? Okay. The list of mistakes goes on and on, but the good news is, in order, in, in addition to the fact that there is no secret to the markets, the good news is, provided you have a little bit of experience, the good news is you know what you're doing wrong. And as I often say, it's like the doctor doctor joke, hurts when I do this. Well, don't do that. Now, the next one is really, really Captain Obvious. Market can only do three things. Market can go up. A market can go down. And sometimes a market can go sideways. Now, many people lose focus of this. And I know it's very Captain Obvious, but it amazes me how many times people fight trends. I had a neighbor stop by the other day in the middle of the day, and he says, I'm a short crude. And that was, I'll have to think back to what day that was. I can look at the charts and see him like, I don't know, it seems to be going up. I'm, you know me, I'm a trend following moron. Or if you go to my website, at least you'd know that. I'm not sure why people fight trends. As I often say, unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is. And don't complicate things with a wave count, or plotting 15 oscillators. And of course, forget about the situation in Nigeria. Now, in order to capture this on the recording, I know I've said it a dozen times, but the situation in Nigeria was when I was speaking at Traders Expo a few years back, and I was talking about how we were actually shorting the energies because they were going down, and somebody blurts out in a Hinder Kissinger kind of voice, what about the situation in Nigeria? And I'm like, oh, I don't know what's going on in Nigeria. And he explained to me that there was some sort of situation in Nigeria that would make all prices go higher. But all prices were going down and these stocks were going down and they continued to drop significantly from that point. And as trend followers, we were able to participate nicely. 
but confusing the issue with facts. Again, trying to outsmart the market, trying to be logical, kept this gentleman from shorting energies. As I preach, up, down, or sideways, that's the back of my business card right there. That's a scan of it. Now, the situation in Nigeria brings us to our next point. News is noise. But Dave, sometimes the market goes up on news or down on news. Well, yeah, I'm not saying that, that news does not affect the markets, but trying to connect the dots can get you into a lot of trouble. And I've seen this happen over and over again. I think I wrote about it way back in Layman's 10 years ago, whenever I wrote the book. Sometimes the media will say the market went up because oil went down. And sometimes the media will say the market went down because oil went down. It's like it's confusing. Let me just rewind that, see if I said that right. Sometimes the media will say the market went down because oil went up. And sometimes the media will say the market went down because oil went down. Well, which one is it? Is oil good for markets or is oil bad for markets? Now, along those lines, and I'm getting a little further ahead of myself about the market being a bad teacher, but you have to be careful when you do have those positive or inverse correlations. Years ago, every now and then I'll stop into a forum and then I'll, I'll realize how stupid it was for me to pop into a forum because a lot of these people are just trolls and they just want to argue back and forth. But anyway, long story endless, I stopped in and I was contributing a little bit, showing them bow ties on intraday charts with S&Ps because I figured they were interested in that kind of thing. And somebody comes in as the be all, know all expert explaining to me that I was FOS and all you had to do was trade the opposite way of where the dollar was going. If the dollar went down, then you bought the S&Ps and vice versa. Well, that's great, and that seems to be working, and they seem to be printing money, but that's not always the case. You've got to be very careful connecting the dots. Now, every methodology has its nuances, and this was hard for me to wrap my head around early in my career. I couldn't believe how streaky momentum trading is. I still can't believe how streaky it is, and as I've said before, I was told, that I make it sound too elusive by Peter Moffey, who I have a quote from in just a few slides. But it is, and I haven't solved for that. And as I often say, the day I solve for that streaky nature is a day that you'll never see my fat ass again. Now, sometimes you print money, and when you're in print money phase, you can't let it go to your head. I see it happen all the time. There's going to be times when there's absolutely nothing to do, like right now. And people get very bored and people give up. They're either fire off day trades or they get bored or give up. I've got a few people quit the service recently. The market's been going sideways. A few people quit the service. And I seem to notice that a few stocks are now beginning to move. Well, they probably gave up right before the market began to take off. Now, the bottom line is you will have to learn how to be patient when there's nothing to do. As Peter Moffey once said, speaking of Peter Moffey, don't invent trades. And this is a st reoccurring story here, but it's a good story. I got asked to be on an institutional project a while back, and we were going to submit trades. And I said, Peter, I don't know if you, I'm your guy or not, because I might go days, weeks, and maybe even longer without anything to submit. I'm, I just won't have that constant input. And he goes, Dave, you're exactly the guy we want on the project. Don't invent trades. And by the way, me being super duper selective, I just sat back and let everybody else submit trades until I felt like I had the mother ball trade and I submitted it. And then I'd back off and I did that again and again. And it worked out very, very nicely. Uh, I had never met Larry McMillan in person. And when I met him in person, I didn't think he knew who I was. He's like, I know who you are. I'm like, oh, wow, Larry McMillan knows who I am. And he said, you are on fire doing that project. Well, I didn't do anything that I didn't normally do, but the market conditions did help. But me staying out of the market conditions when they're less than ideal and only dipping in when I saw everything sort of lined up 
really help me out. I was very nervous about looking like an idiot. I was very nervous about getting fired for this job. I was very nervous to be on a team with Larry McMillan and some of these other people out there who have been around a long, long time you know, are a lot smarter than I am. So I was very humbled by this project. The problem with markets is trading done properly can often be quite boring. And as I preach, if you are looking for excitement, then you need to go to Las Vegas. At least the pretty girl will bring you a drink while you lose your money. Or as I often joke, and I think I've aggravated some people who are going through this situation, but if you want excitement, have an affair. That way you only lose half of your money. The number eight secret to trading is you only need one methodology. Another one of the classic Dave stories is I used to wake up every morning really early in program systems. I still get up super early now, but my work is elsewhere. My work is analyzing the market, seeing what happened overnight, seeing what I'm up against for the day, doing some research, working on projects, like lately I've been working on learning management system. But back then, back in the day, I'd wake up and program at least two hours a day, first two hours a day. And I would always run into the house and tell my wife about this great system I just made and how the drawdowns were this and how accurate it was and blah, blah, blah. And then one day she said, how many systems do you need? And it kind of hit me. It was a bit of an epiphany for me. You need just one system, the one that's conceptually correct. Now, by conceptually correct, I mean there has to be some sort of psychological backing to it. At least that's my way of defining conceptually correct. For instance, a trend knockout is a pattern where you have a sharp sell-off, a one-bar sell-off in a very nice trend. It should stick out like a sore thumb as I preach. That will likely knock out the Johnny come lately, the people who are last into the market, who also tend to be the first out. Those people can often wreak havoc upon your existing trades because they sell, they don't have much staying power, they can't, they can't hold through a correction, and they dump their position and often takes you out with them. It also attracts eager shorts. And if the market begins to rally and that TKO triggers, then those shorts will eventually be squeezed out. Also, the Johnny come latelys might, they're the worst traders ever. They might throw in the towel, can't stand it, and then jump in as that market begins to go parabolic. And the action of the shorts and the Johnny come latelys in and of themselves can help that market become even more parabolic. And that's just one small example of something that I believe is very sound and conceptually correct. But you're going to have to find the one that makes the most sense to you. If you can't wrap your head around it, then toss it out. It also has to fit your lifestyle. One of the doctors I like to pick on is really smart and he's a really good trader, but he's, he's prone to make some mistakes. And he's gotten better over the years, but he used to carry a, a laptop with it from the Roman day trade. Well, you're either going to be a really crappy doctor or a really crappy day trader. You're not going to be able to do both. So the system that makes sense, and, and more importantly, the one that you're going to follow consistently is the system for you. Now, if you start with something simple, which we'll get to in a few slides, and you're successful with it, that's fantastic. But if you're not successful with one methodology, what makes you think you can trade a dozen? So do one thing and do it well. Let me repeat that. Do one thing and do it well. It reminds me of the first City Slickers where Curly, the older seasoned cowboy guy, had the secret to life. All the middle-aged men were coming down to try to figure out life to the ranch, take one week off, go to the ranch, and he holds up his finger. And he says, so the secret of life is your finger? It's like, no, one thing. Just do one thing. But do it well. So my work is done. I'm going to drop the mic. No, my work is not done. <laughs> because, like the preacher earlier I mentioned, 
I'm going to keep saying these things until you people do it. Now, you have to plan the trade and trade to plan. And I was thinking that maybe I need to make this sound more like a secret as opposed to a statement. And along those lines, as I'm going live with this presentation, I was thinking maybe a better way of saying this is the battle is won ahead of time. The battle is won long before you actually get into the trade. All you have to do, and I know it's easier said than done, as I often say, if there's a leak in a pipe or something, my wife is like, well, all you have to do is just tighten this thing. She makes it sound a lot easier than it really is. But all you have to do once you plan that trade, and, and planning a trade is very easy. If you can't plan your trade, then that's an easy fix. All you have to do, quoting my wife, Marcy, is learn the methodology, learn where you should get in, learn where you should take partial profits based on the volatility of the market, stops and where you take partial profits or based on the volatility of the market, and then learn roughly how you're going to trail the stop, at least speaking from my methodology. You're trading some other methodology, learn how the methodology works, and it should be fairly easy to plan your trade with a little bit of experience now following the actual plan is not as i'll preach and teach in a few minutes or beat the dead horse you'd say market is a very bad teacher when you go to trade a plan you're going to be tempted to do a lot of things that you shouldn't but what you could do is you could say well i'm going to force myself to put a stop in then i'm going to go about my life. I'm going to go save lives, work on some automatic transmissions, defend some bad guys or good guys, depending on what type of lawyer you are. I have a good friend of mine's a lawyer. And it's like, well, let's hope some uh, bad, some uh, good guys come your way. And he's like, oh, no, no, I don't make any money off good guys, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. But the best traders do what they have to do and then go about their life. Now, the reason I say place the actual order is because it becomes a passive decision and not an active one. If you're sitting there trying to make an active decision, in other words, during the heat of battle, a lot of times you're going to be tempted to do the wrong thing. You'll be tempted to let that market just blast through your stop and keep on going. But if you put a stop in place, an actual stop, provided the markets, you're not using a little discretion, which is another lesson, but if you place an actual stop, the market is nowhere near your stop. You place an actual stop and go about your life. If something bad happens, then you get taken out of the position. You're not, again, sitting there like a deer in the headlights. So micromanagement is something that I've talked about extensively. And it's hard not to micromanage. It's hard to sit in a trade that's not going anywhere for a couple of months. We have one in the portfolio that's finally beginning to move. It's still in the water, so I'm not bragging. But for almost two months, this stock has been negative in the minus column. But it hasn't hit the stop. So what do you do? Nothing. But a lot of people are thinking, well, it's dead money. I could put that money to work elsewhere. So they cash out. It happens over and over and over. It's human nature now you cannot separate emotions from trading how many times have you seen people's like oh you have to remove emotions from trading you have to move emotions from trading you cannot move remove emotions from trading you cannot remove emotions from life we are emotional creatures there's a reason why we're emotional creatures it helps us stay out of danger it helps us to make decisions every decision has to have an emotional consequence otherwise you would make some really bad decisions it's been proven and this is through the work of, of Scholl and Damasio. I think Damasio was the first because he wrote about a long time ago. Uh, what's the name of that book? I have it here somewhere. I'm going to say the name wrong and look like an idiot. Uh, 
something era. Anyway, it's been proven through the unfortunate uh, incident of either ac an accident or something like cancer where your amygdala in that area of your brain, that sort of primitive brain, so-called lizard brain, you're up and around your limbic system and all. If that's been damaged, you can't make decisions because one decision doesn't have a consequence over the other one. And a story that I've told quite a bit is when a doctor asked a patient who's had that unfortunate problem, when the doctor asks the patient, would you like to meet next Tuesday or next Wednesday, they'll talk about all the reasons they should meet on Tuesday, and then they'll talk about all the reasons they should meet on Wednesday, and then they'll go back to Tuesday, talk about that Wednesday, rinse and repeat. And they arrive at a stalemate. Why? Because one doesn't have an emotion over the other. One doesn't have a consequence over the other. Now, what I've done with this to help my trading out is every time I'm asked to make a decision, I think about those emotions involved with the decision. For instance, even when we're gonna have for lunch, okay? I like fried food, okay? <laughs> That's how I got the, the name Big Dave. So I'm thinking today, I love to go get some fried catfish. There's a little gas station, I say not too far, it's one of the closest stores to my house, but it's like seven miles away. And they make great fried catfish. But if I look at the fried catfish, I'm gonna be a little lethargic this afternoon. So I gotta think about that. I've got a lot of projects going on. I've got a lot going on right now. So that lunch decision, even though it's a very small decision, it does have some emotions attached to it. It does have some consequences attached to it. So again, you can't make a decision without emotions and stress so you have to embrace your emotions recognize when they occur don't try to control them but just embrace them and again make some passive decisions that's going to help you tremendously with the market actually place that order let's say you come in and you're looking to enter a stock let's say at 10 bucks a share and the stock's at nine dollars and fifty cents a share well you could put in a stop entry order at 10 bucks a share and go about your life or you could sit there all day long and then finally it hits 10 and then you start to reason why you should or should not enter the stock even though your plan was to enter the stock the main secret to controlling your emotions and the reason i say controlling in quotes is because you can't control or completely control your emotions but if you just breathe the amygdala is very fast acting it creates a surge of emotions very quickly it helps to keep us alive so if you're getting ready to step out on a curb step off a curb I should say and then you see a taxi cab which is about a foot away from you doing 30 miles an hour you don't have time to contemplate your navel you have this huge rush of emotions and a reflexive action to jump out the way. Well, that's great to keep you alive from a taxi cab hitting you, but in trading, it could really be your own worst enemy. So the secret to that, as I talked about extensively in trading full circle, is to just breathe, okay? And this thing says, what's her name? Martina McBride, who... Um, sang the song just breathe and that's who that is there i think so just breathe and that few seconds will help you to bypass your amygdala which is that little tiny part of your brain now as i just said i learned about the fact that every decision has an emotion and then in order for me to be holistic in what I do, because all I think about is trading, or one of the things I think about is trading, is I think about the emotions of lunch. I think of the emotions of all the decisions in my life, wrap my head around that. So I was like, okay, well, I need to think about the emotions in my trading. 
And one of those exercises that I've been practicing, although my wife might argue, is whenever I feel a little bit of a rush come up, that blood begin to flow to my head and, and I get a little instantly sweaty or whatever and want to like have that little snapback reaction in my head. I'm like, count to three. And then I get that little Terminator thing going on in my head, the little Terminator thing where you make these decisions, go away or <laughs> even worse. And I have been shocked at how many arguments in situations, awkward situations, I have avoided with my wife since I learned about these emotions. Now, you ask her, she's like, really? It's like, well, she doesn't realize that I'd be in a lot more hot water had I not thought of this. And then when I do have that snap decision, snap back, whatever, I think, oh, I should have waited a few seconds before that. So now I'm trying to learn how to breathe. Well, the same thing goes to trading. As I talked about in Trading Full Circle, talking about the work of Dr. Robert Mara, you have to tiptoe past your fears. Well, what was it? Wait by why caused the little panic monster. So you've got that little panic monster inside your brain, and he's very easy to wake up. So you have to just breathe so you can tiptoe around him and get to the rest of what's sloshing around up there, not to get into neurology and show you what little I know, but I do know that we have these older primitive parts of our brain, which are very, very, very small. And then the whole thing that when you see a brain, that whole thing that looks like a brain is the top of your brain. That's the that's your conscience. That's what makes you you. But buried deep below that and what that's just sitting on top of it is that little tiny part of your brain that has your emotions and that little brain no pun intended, can't control the big brain. So be careful with that. Now, here's the mother of all dead horse lectures, or as my brother-in-law says, I say horse, horse. The market could be a really bad teacher. And I see this happen over and over and over again. A few weeks back, I was at a cocktail party. And there's a guy there that likes to trade, and, and he always seeks me out to tell me about his latest foray into the markets. And he was telling me about something, and I said, well, it's not my style, but as long as you have a stop in place, then I'm sure you're okay. I'm sure you know what you're doing. He goes, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't use stops anymore. Every time I use a stop, they're out to get me. They're out to get my stop. So I no longer use stops. Now, the market has generally been going up for a long, long time. So he's probably done quite well in doing that. But as I often preach, there's a lot of things that will work until they don't. Every time the market gets choppy, I start getting these emails i found myself on a lot of these marketing lists either intentional or not sometimes i like to say all right this guy seems like really out there and he seems to be like pumping a bunch of crap let me just get on his mailing list and see what he's got to say and that's where i get a lot of fodder for these presentations fyi but i've noticed lately the market's been choppy lately so i've been getting a lot of these reversion to the mean type of Systems people are promoting. We're selling these options. And this is, we're just making money. We're printing money day after day after day. It's like, well, that'll work until it don't. I remember a while back, somebody sent me something and they showed you how easy the trade was. And all you had to do was wait till elect expiration, option expiration. It was risking $10 to make $1. But they made it sound like you automatically are going to make that $1 no matter what. Unfortunately, every now and then you're going to lose $10, okay? And you only have to lose 10 to 1 a few times to be in a whole lot of trouble. So the market is a very bad teacher. I can go on and on about this. The main thing I would warn you is 
what you see is always not what you get. And that's a line from Thinking Fast and Slow, which is a good book, by the, by the way. I encourage you to read it. A lot of good things that sort of dovetail in with the markets and behavioral finance. But in Thinking Fast and Slow, what they mean by that, what you see is not all there is, and I forget their acronym for it, is that it's kind of like the, the blind man feeling on the elephant. You know, one's going to feel a, a rope, one's going to feel a tree trunk, and one's going to feel a wall or whatever. There's more to it than just that. So if you're in a choppy market and you start selling options or selling when the market is high and buying when the market is low, you're going to feel pretty smart. But there's more to markets than just that. So, again, you really need to resist the temptation of joining the church of what's happening now. Just because something's working great now doesn't mean that will always be the case. And I know people who end up perpetually out of phase. They'll start trading a choppy market system when they notice the market is choppy. And then all of a sudden the market begins a trend. They get a huge drawdown, but then they switch over to being a trend follower. And by the time they switch over to be a trend follower, the market gets choppy again. And they end up perpetually out of phase. It's one of the biggest problems that I see. Now, I'm not smart enough to shift gears. In fact, nobody is. Okay. There was a trader once that told me if the market was breaking out and following through, he was a breakout trader. If the market was breaking out but reversing soon after it broke out, oh, no, no, he played the reverse. He's a reversal trader. Okay. And if the market was just trending in general, he's a trend trader. And I call BS on that because nobody is that good. And if you think about it, you will have some lag in a market before that situation changes. So it's going to be choppy for a while before it starts trending. And then it's in an obvious trend. So there's no way you're going to be able to beat that lag of a market. So don't even try. You're going to be wrong a lot. Get used to it. Now, I've tried to solve for being wrong a lot. I'd much rather, by the way, I'd much rather be less right and make more money than more right and make less money. And I think William Eckert has a really good quote about that, how there's this allure to these highly accurate systems, which turn out to be the worst when it comes to making actual money in the markets. And that's the that's the reversion to the mean things that I've talked about in this presentation and talk about often. But the bottom line is you're going to be wrong a lot. And it's hard to be wrong, especially if you're smart. It's very hard to be wrong. It's also hard to be wrong and wrong and wrong and then eventually be right and make money. It's hard to go through that cycle. What's even more perverse and even harder is that even when you're right, you're going to be wrong most of the time. Now, I've done complete presentations on this. And Robert Frey did a one of my clients sent me a video by Robert Frey on YouTube. Really good uh, video. I'd, I'd encourage you to watch it. And from that, I glean that you spend 75% of the time in a state of regret, drawdown. So based on Mr. Frey's research, and he's a lot smarter than I am, 75% of the time, you're not going to be happy with your trades. When I, my wife said, well, hey, what are you talking about? And I said, well, I'm talking about the fact that 75% of the time, markets will go against you, and you're in a state of regret based on this research of this gentleman. And she goes, well, that explains a lot. That explains why I'm in a bad mood 75% of the time. My good friend Greg Morris said that markets only make new highs 4% of the time. The rest of the time, they're backing and filling. So if you think about it, if you apply that just to an individual trade, even if you have a great trade like this one here, this came out of trading full circle, You'll notice the green is when you are making money on a trade or making new money, okay? 
In other words, your account is increasing from its last high point. You're coming out of the drawdown based on this particular position. So for instance, let me just whip out the pen. I knew I'd whip it out sooner or later. So right here, right here the market starts making new highs. So your equity curve begins to look like this, okay? But then what happens, it begins to consolidate. So you begin to give up some of that money. And everywhere it's red, you're giving up money. And everywhere it's green, you're making money. You're making new money, okay? So that looks pretty good. You give up a little bit. That looks pretty good. Then you give up a little bit for a long, long time. You finally make money again. And then you go back to losing money on the position. Doesn't mean the position is no longer a good position. It just means that a lot of times the markets are going to spend backing and filling. And that's when most people exit. If you quit at 25%, as I preach, you will never make 50% on a trade. If you quit at 50% on a trade, you'll never make 100%, and so on and so forth. What's the name of the book on psychology? Uh, which one? I, missed, I mentioned so many of them. Uh, Dr. Robert Mara wrote a book called The Kaizen Way. It's a very short little read. I would suggest you read it. Go to my go to davelander.com slash books to read. I think that's where it is on my website. And let's see if I can find it. His other one I would encourage you to read would be Mastering Fear. And let me give you the link to all these. Thanks for asking. Yes, books dash two dash read. Okay. So if you go to that page, you'll see it's Mastering Fear and The Kaizen Way. Both are very short reads. Both are very, very good. The Kaizen Way really struck a chord with me. Basically, The Kaizen Way is telling you that you can make little tiny changes. Your brain doesn't like a big change. That's why I said tiptoe past the panic monster. And that's why I've written extensively about, hey, just for one trade, wrap your head around just one trade. It's hard to wrap your head around, okay, the rest of my life, I'm going to have to follow this plan. But just one trade, you could say, well, you could do anything once, right? So that's kind of the Kaizen way. You just make a very small change and you kind of tiptoe past that panic monster, so to speak. But both of these books are really good, and I would urge you to read both of them. If you don't mind, get them off of my website, and I'll make about, I don't know, 35 cents. But it's better than the Pocony, and I'll put, that, I'll put that right back into the website. The one on the amygdala, um, I'm going to say it wrong. The Socrates era, D-E-S-E. C-R-A-T-E-S, era. That's why I didn't want to say the name. I don't know if I'm saying it right or not. Um, but, yeah, that one that one wasn't the best book in the world from what I remember. I'm not sure I even finished it, but I got the meat of it. The reason I read it was I wanted to have a reference for that if you, got, if you uh, were to be injured in the brain or what happens to the amygdala when that happens. And, you know, a little soft sell here. Get the trading psychology micro course and all of that research thus far is is actually in there. OK, and that's a subset of trading full circle. And if you get the micro course, you'll get a discount on trading full circle. Whatever you pay in the micro course will come right off the top. All right. Money and position management is crucial. And as I often say here, as George Carlin once said, when you buy a pet, it's going to end badly. Well, the same thing applies to trading. When you make a trade, it's going to end badly. So if you know this ahead of time, it makes life a lot easier. Now, I can't speak for other methodologies, but I'm sure in other methodologies, you either win or lose. That I can guarantee. I'm sure in other methodologies, you probably give up some open profits. 
okay? If you're trend following, for sure, you're going to give up some open profits at some point in time. So you're either going to get stopped out at a loss or you're going to give up some open profits in the end. And there's a couple of things that can happen in between. But for the most part, you're either going to give up some open profits or you're going to flat out lose if you had to boil it all down. And that pretty much goes for every methodology. So you have to wrap your head around that. And it's a little negative if you think about it. Every trade you go into is going in badly. But if you know that going in, it makes it a lot easier to deal with when the inevitable does occur. Now, I think one of the biggest secrets to trading is that your best defense is a good offense. I often talk about the holistic nature of trading, combining the mind, the methodology, and the money management. If you get better at your methodology, your psyche is going to improve and you're going to be more likely to follow the next trade, follow your plan, and then, of course, your money management will improve. So by a good offense, I mean pick the best markets to begin with. Markets have been chopping around, as I just said, quite a bit. So now is not a good time to be trend trading unless you think you have the mother of all setups. Then you should pass. Yes, the market's a bad teacher because you could have a little selective perception. I saw a few stocks take off lately, recently, that were on my radar. That used to really make me angry, but now I'm like, okay, Dave, well, two or three took off. They were on your radar, but let's go back and look at how many stocks that were on your radar that imploded and just flat out didn't work. And that's kind of the way I wrap my head around that. So there's always going to be something out there that's going to take off without you. You just have to live with it. The bottom line is you want to make sure you're picking the best and leaving the rest to begin with. Get better at your stock picking. Now, obviously, you'll need some experience. The thing that amazes me is doctors, lawyers, automatic transmission mechanics, they decide on a Friday night they want to trade. They read a book on trading over the weekend, and then Monday they start trading. They attempt to transfer success. And I was making a list of, of problems the other day, and that was probably like the number one. Sharpshooting signals, uh, attempting to transfer success. And there's a few other ones in there. Uh, well, one I just mentioned, jumping from system to system depending on the market conditions, joining the church of what's happening now. But one of the biggest problems going into trading is they attempt to transfer success. Once you become very successful at something, you tend to forget how hard it was and how long it took you to become successful. So you have to treat trading like any other career, whether you're doing it part-time or not. I don't suggest you spend every day, all day trading in fact, I would recommend that you learn how to trade and go off and save lives and work on transmissions and defend bad guys. But you will need a little experience. You will have to put your time in. You will have to get your reps in. And that's one of the secrets to trading is getting your reps in and giving yourself time and experience. Now, speaking of time... The market doesn't move on your time frame. This is something I've sort of touched upon throughout this presentation. Is that you get into a trade and it spends a lot of time backing and filling. Or let's say the market's choppy and you're a trend follower and you want to put some money to work. There's nothing to do. The market does not move on your time frame. And it's hard. That's one of the hardest things. Patience is one of the hardest things. It's hard to sit there and wait and wait and wait and wait. The other thing is you must be present to win. If you've read some of my posts, you'll see that this is a fairly reoccurring theme. I remember a while back the market was really, really choppy. 
and a client emailed me and said, Dave, I'm taking a break from the service. I'm going to quit for a while. I'm like, okay. It's like, what's wrong? Well, you haven't recommended anything in a couple of weeks. And based on the choppy nature of the market, I don't see where you're going to see any setups for quite a while. So I'm just going to quit for a while. Okay. And I'm like, well, I, I don't see where I'm going to see any setups for a while either. But I know I preach that you got to keep chipping away at it. That night, literally that night, I found two stocks that would turn into the biggest winners of the year. Now, this is a reoccurring theme. I've seen this happen time and time again. Right now, same sort of thing. Market's chopping around. I can't find a setup to save my life. I have one little IPO I'm keeping an eye on. But for the most part, there's nothing to do. It's like I, I don't feel like doing my – the 3 o'clock comes around, 3 o'clock the market closes. I'm in central time, so it closes at 3. It's like, ah, oh, great. I'm going to have to look at charts for two hours and have absolutely nothing to show for it. And then I'm like, come on, Dave, grab that cup of coffee. You can do it. Do a little self-talk, rally myself. And I go through all the charts. And if I don't find anything, ah, so what? You gave it a shot. Tomorrow's another day. And the reason I keep doing that is because even in less than ideal conditions, I know at some point I'm going to find something that's worthwhile. So you have to be present to win. And I see that. I see it happen all the time. It's like people give up on trend following as I preach, market does this, people give up a trend following, then what happens? The market does this. Okay? They decide to get back in, what happens? The market does this. <laughs> so you must be present to win. And that's kind of tough. Okay. <laughs> I, I can't I can't repeat the question, but no, I'm not a fan of that individual. Simply because it's always the end of the world. It's always a major top. And he gets it right about once every 30 years. So uh, no thank you. Now, I left this slide in from last week. We could get a death cross soon, and I'll show you that on a chart. It's not what happens from cross to cross, from death cross to golden cross, it's what happens in between. It's the magnitude of the move in between. And I'll flesh that out in just one second. Again, don't join the church of what's happening now. It's never different this time. And then I've been quoting Judd Dotery a lot lately from Stadium Capital. Active management has underperformed since the lows of 2009. Now, this was in Greg's book, which came out a few years ago, but it's just as relevant today. But this is to be expected. Anyone who has kept pace with the market the last few years should be questioned because they have not made any moves that would or will protect a portfolio when the next inevitable bear market occur. So that's kind of a testament for using stops. If you look at the market over the past few years, it's gone mostly up, but it's had some pretty nasty spills along the way. And what Judd Dotery is, is uh, uh, what he's saying there, what he's alluding to is the word I'm looking for. What he's alluding to is the fact that they didn't use stops and they should have gotten knocked out the market a couple times. They should have gotten some whipsaws. Not that you want to get whipsaws. Whipsaws suck. But you have to be willing to stomach a whipsaw or two in order to avoid a bear market. As Greg Morris told me a couple of years back, whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating. You could survive frustration. Now, as you can tell, a lot of slides, these presentations, when I go put, a, put slides together, I used to reinvent the wheel and make everything from scratch. Now, I draw heavily upon trading full circle. So I guess if you watch these presentations for about five years, you'll end up getting the whole course. <laughs> if you want a little quicker, you can go to this link here. You'll get the first videos for free, and then I think uh, right now there's a special offer if you continue uh, with the videos out of the first four. So check that out. The link, again, is daylander.com slash 2 trade stocks dash successfully. I probably should shorten that, Earl. All right. Let's look at the charts. Any 
questions, comments, interesting anecdotes on anything we've said so far? Before I forget, let's flesh out that potential death cross. Dun, dun, dun. Well, the death cross is when the 50-day moving average crosses over, crosses under, I guess, the 200-day moving average. Now, if you just sold when it crossed below and bought when it crosses above, there is a very, 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 very tiny edge. That's not what's important. What's important is the magnitude of the move. For instance, if you go back to 2007, peak to trough, it went a long, long ways after that death cross, okay? You wouldn't necessarily want to sell it and then wait for the market to come all the way back up or vice versa because you'd probably end up making very little or no money longer term doing that. But it's the magnitude of the move. Just like I've been saying in the past several weeks, you can't have a bear market without downside daylight. And I'll show you that in just one second. Now, what's interesting is the moving averages have finally caught up. Notice this little flattening of the moving average. The reason it was headed lower, as I said last couple of weeks, is that you had a drop-off effect. What that means is we were adding in these low prices here relative to these high prices, but now the moving average has begun to catch up. So it's beginning to flat out. So this might just be, I think they call that a squeeze. This might just be a squeeze where these two come together. And longer term, it's actually healthy for a market. Now, what I was talking about as far as daylight, let's go back to a regular chart and just put a 50 in. With daylight, you're looking for the lows to be less than the moving average for downside daylight or above the moving average for upside daylight. And I've had, uh, I had my moving average set up for a IPO pattern. So let me get the 50 back in. Let's take a look at that on a weekly basis. And if you go in and watch the last couple of weeks, I didn't redo it for this week because nothing much has changed. And I forget, did we actually, does anybody know if we tagged the, the telechart uses a rolling period for their weeks. And Metastock, I think, uses an actual calendar week, but I don't think we actually tagged it on a weekly basis. And I'll pull up those. I have to pull up those daylight indicators later on. Let's see. The low is, by the way, uh, keep an eye out. I will be doing a presentation for Metastock soon on my indicators, which are soon to be released. So the low is 255380, and the moving average is 255. Okay, so it did tag the moving average, I think. Is that correct? Moving average is 2555, 253. So it's hard to see, but it actually did touch that moving average. So that would have gotten rid of the downside, the upside daylight. Daylight, again, means the lows are greater than the moving average. Nothing magical about that, but it can help to keep you on the right side of the market. By the way, this is one of those 2015, 2016. This is one of those periods where you should have gotten knocked out of the market. If you didn't, then you are throwing caution to the wind. And that's what, again, Mr. Dotery was saying, is that anyone who didn't get in and out of the market and just rode it the whole way up, the question, the problem is, that's great, but they're going to ride it all the way down, more than likely. Now, let's get back to the P's on a micro level. We're getting a bit of a sell-off today, obviously. It, it amazes me that we have a few up days in here and it's kind of one of those what you see is not all what you get right it's like they're looking back a week or so and say well this market just keeps going higher well if you're looking at it longer term and you're seeing that like back here maybe okay i'll give it to you yeah it's in a trend but it takes more than a few days or even a few weeks sometimes to start a new trend so that's why I didn't get bullish, even though some other people were getting bullish, not to take anything away from them, because yesterday I was thinking or day before I was like, well, maybe they're right. You know, 
But now you see we're bumping up against that overhead supply. As a trend follower, here's the deal. I'm totally okay with giving up the move from here up to here, okay? That's not that huge of a move. At this juncture, I'd like to see this market make new highs before I start getting excited about the long side. Unless, of course, I see a stock that could either do what? Trade opposite or trade uh, ignore whatever the market direction, such as energy stocks or other commodity stocks sometimes can do that. Let me start over. I'm willing to forego getting long any stocks until the market makes new highs unless two things. One, I see the mother of all setups or two. It's a commodity related stock that is trending in spite of the overall market. They don't always trend in spite of the overall market. But right now, we'll take a look at energies in one second. They're beginning to wake up. Now, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ selling off a little bit today. Not the end of the world. It's had a pretty good run lately. What concerns me here is this whole rally just looks like a retrace. For those keeping score, we did have a daily bow tie, and that did actually trigger right here on the short side. So far, that signal obviously hasn't worked. But what's concerning is that's coming off of a double top. Usually, if you get a bow tie off a double top or a double bow tie or a second mouse is what I normally call them. This wasn't actually a bow tie, but sometimes you get a bow tie, and then that second bow tie is the real signal. Now, a few big updates would make all the difference in the world, but for now, I would remain cautious. Now, I'm not shorting with both fists either, but if I see a short that looks really good, I'll probably take it. we got a couple in the portfolio. We've been having two in the portfolio forever. I didn't get aggressive on the short side. I didn't see the need just yet. I like to have everything setup driven. If I see a setup that I like, I take it. The Steve Winwood trade. Now, as far as double bow ties, the Russell did make a double bow tie. And let's see, this one technically I don't think triggered. Made a first thrust in a bow tie. The moving average is crossed, but that didn't happen until. So this one, this one technically isn't a bow tie triggered, but I think this one is. This one, yes, this one actually triggered. So those second signals shouldn't be ignored, even though it hasn't worked just yet. I would keep an eye on the prior highs. Go back in and watch the presentation that I did last week, I believe, a week before actually, on transitional patterns. And look at what I said about a high remains in place until taken out after you have a signal. Now, the energies, as I said, energies are waking up in here and looking pretty good. Again, though, because this is happening at mid-levels, okay, I'd like to see them actually make new highs for getting too excited unless I see an individual stock that looks pretty darn good. So maybe when they correct, remember we're playing pullbacks, maybe when they correct, we'll find something. Do you come in just because the market makes new highs? No, no. I don't necessarily come in, but if the market's making new highs, I'll say, okay, well, the overall market – is doing pretty good okay so do i have a setup that i like yes i'm going to take it okay now right now until we get to those new highs does the overall market look pretty good well it looks like it wants to go back down but if i wasn't smart enough to figure out what direction it's going i could say well it's at 2700 ish where was it back in february 2700 ish so on a net-net basis, the Rip Van Winkle test that I often talk about, fall asleep, wake up a month later or two months later and say, hey, where's the market? If it's relatively unchanged, then it's not a trend. So, okay, I got a setup. Eh, it's a mediocre setup. Market's not doing so good. Eh, I'm not going to take it. Market's making new highs, and I have a setup – and it's pretty good looking setup, then I'll probably take it. So right now, a setup would have to knock my socks off. Now, the only danger in that is like when I finally do put a setup into trading service, people would think, wow, Dave thinks it's the greatest thing to slice bread. And I do, but the problem is you have to realize you could still be wrong. I sure would make a lot more money in this educational business if I would talk about 
how much money you're going to make and how you'll never be wrong. But that's not the reality. You're going to be wrong sometimes. Let's take a look at some areas. Drugs sort of failed to participate in this big rally that we had recently. And you can see they're breaking down fairly hard today, down a percent and a half. This whole thing, albeit kind of a, a little ABC up or whatever, just looked like a retrace to me. And now it looks like they're in this new leg down. And there's quite a few areas look like that. Some areas did make it, like health services made it to the prior little peak in here. But they're sideways at best, and they're still just kind of stalling in their retrace rally. So go in and look at all these areas that have retraced up. And until and unless they at least take out that retrace high, I would not get very excited about the market. Retail, another good example. Kind of had this little, had this first thrust here. And let's see if it bow tied. Just for s and No, nope, not really bow tie. Not really a bow tie, but a first thrust. A perfect little first thrust here. Trigger would have been here. But notice that it didn't take out the high of that little retrace rally. And then it made another retrace. A little bit easier to see. Sold off to here, made a little retrace. Okay, still didn't take out that first little retrace. So until and unless retail gets past this little retrace high, I would have a very hard time getting excited about it. Now, some areas, like the semis, for instance, did break out to brand new highs. We had a couple of sell signals here. Let's see, the bow tie was a little late, but I think you had a first thrust. In the yeah, you had a first thrust down all time highs, a little bit of a pullback, it did a little sell off, but then it went on to make new highs. Okay, so you got very little, if anything, out of that short, went on to make new highs, and now it's kind of a rinse and repeat doing it again. This is scary. Okay, now that's got that's not get too sucked up into the intraday you know, today ain't over with yet, right? Yet, let me rewind that. The day ain't over, right? But look at that, down 3%, 3.3% so far. This is why I have a hard time getting excited when the market's rallying up a little bit over a couple of weeks when bigger picture it looks like it still could be in trouble. And we had a bow tie here. Let me clean the chart up a little bit. So a lot of areas kind of look like the NASDAQ itself. That second signal, as I often say, early bird gets a worm, second mouse gets the cheese. And the trigger on that would have been just eyeballing it. Probably would have been right here. Your trigger would have been below this low. And it didn't really pay off right away. Well, what's a market's job? A market's job is to frustrate the most, cause the most amount of pain. And the corollary to that is to do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner. And I borrowed those from Linda Rasky. And when I gave her credit, she said, I don't know where I got them. Probably off the floor. But you could see that the obvious thing is this market was rolling over. Well, what does it do first? It rally, it fakes out to the downside, rallies up, and now it's beginning to roll over. Now, let's think about the psychology of the market participants. Everyone who held through this little slide here is breathing a collective sigh of relief, and now they're getting punished. Okay? We're short. Let me see if it's – let me just pull it up. We're short PHM, okay? And this is the one I was talking about earlier. It's finally beginning to pay off. Hopefully. Now, anyone who owned it up here was making money. And when it begins to sell off over here, they're like, oh, crap, I'm losing money. Or giving up on open profits. Wait a minute. Oh, look, it's going to break out. Everything's fine. And then now what's happening? It's beginning to break down again. So just think about the psychology of the participants. Market looked really good last week or so. And now it's beginning to come unglued a little bit. Somebody emailed me, see, confusing the issue with facts. We're short Pulte, which is a homemaker, or home builder, I should say. And a week ago or two ago, another home builder came out with great earnings. And I got emails. Hey, Dave, you know, uh, whatever those other guys name are, DHR or whatever they are, they came out with great earnings. I'm like, okay, well, so what? Well, it's like they're worried about that. Well, there's always something to worry about in the markets. But don't try to connect the dots, especially when it comes to news. Now, most of the sectors are mixed at best, except for 
metals and energies. Metals are looking okay here. For me, you know me, I sure would like to see them make new highs. Yes, this is a bow tie in case you're keeping score, but it's coming off of, it's not coming off of major, major, major lows. For me to get excited about a bow tie, I like to see a bow tie like that in 2016. Or I think it was, when was the last top? 2014, a bow tie like this coming off of multi year highs or lows. I'm not as excited about the ones that are coming off of mid levels. So for the metals, ideally, I like to see new highs before taking positions here. But if I see something that looks fantastic because the sector itself is improving, I might be willing to dip a toe in. But it's going to have to be one charming looking stock. And most sectors are a combination of what we talked about earlier. They're either going to be have recently broken out, stalled out, and came right back in, like the NASDAQ itself, such as the semiconductors and most other technology, or they have stalled out in a retrace, or just never really did get off their butt like drugs. So you'll see that over and over. How do you determine where is the trigger? Uh, for the bow tie, it's pretty simple. Uh, go in and watch that presentation I did two weeks ago. With the transitional, I'll go ahead and give it to you too. With the transitional patterns, what happens is, if I get a blank screen up here. With the transitional patterns, you're looking... Let me rewind that a little bit. With a with a let's say you're trading a generic pullback. You're trading a market that looks like this and then it pulls back, okay? Well, a textbook entry would be right here, right above this high. But what you might want to do is give it a little bit of wiggle room, especially given the current uh, conditions, okay? And the reason you do that is a lot of times a market maker or whoever will push that market up or noise alone, whatever you want to call it just to get that trigger and then it'll come right back in. If you have a trigger up here, a little bit higher, and again, I went into a lot of this in a lot more details in trading full circle. The, the trade-off, of course, is that the higher you trigger, the, the less of that reversion to the mean, the less of that bounce you get back in the intended direction, back in the direction of the underlying trend. Now, with something like a bow tie, as soon as all three moving averages have crossed over, you begin watching for that first bar of pullback. So it could be one little tiny bar. I wish I could draw a little straighter. Uh, one little tiny bar of pullback. And then you look to enter below the low of that bar. And hopefully you can give it a little bit of wiggle room. But the thing is, the point is, you're not waiting for a deep pullback. Okay, let's say you got a sell off. You're not waiting for this thing to pull back and make a major retrace. You're looking to get on that first little signs of correction. So let's say a market's bottoming out, rallies off of lows, and makes one little tiny bar pullback like that. You're looking to get in somewhere around here. You're not waiting for this market to keep pulling back because a lot of other people are. Whoever still short this market from way back here is hoping that the market continue to roll back over. And if it goes up, they're going to be screwed. Again, the psychology of the market's participants rears its ugly head. People looking to buy the stock who wanted a bottom fish are like, well, wait a minute. I missed the bottom. No, I didn't. Here it comes. Let me let it pull back a little bit. And if it doesn't do this and it begins to take off, they're going to have to put up or shut up. So, again, there's your psychological backing. So, with a transitional setup, you get in at the first signs of a correction. So, go in and watch last, I'm sorry, April 5th, 2018 for that. Good question though. Thanks for the question. And good morning. All right. Let's uh, let's open it up for individual stocks. Oh geez, boy, Chief Ormo's really wound up today. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, well I'll tell you what, I'll make it up to you next week. I'll give you more time next week for choice. But yeah, any any let's uh let's go through this quickly. Any individual stocks you guys want to talk about real quick? There's not going to be a whole lot of light because of the um, markets. You killed all my – oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you killed all my stock pick questions today with that presentation. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's – you know, that's the thing. It's like um, I've had people come to the shows week after week. And they're like, well, you've never liked one thing that I've picked. And it's like, well, two things. One, 
pick better stocks. And number two, the market's been really choppy, and that's why. Okay, the question is Tesla. Anybody watching Billions? I think it's kind of cool. They, uh, they did a little thing on him. Tesla's a little too wide and loose for me to get excited about it. And it's really, really thick. It's just too wide and loose. Uh, let me interview myself. Is it in trouble? Yes. Okay. If you were just asking me to give me give you my technical opinion, I'd say Tesla's in a lot of trouble. You have a tremendous amount of overhead supply. I've been paid before to give uh, technical opinions on things such as bonds and all. And that's where you have to look at the market every day and figure out what's going on. But as far as me, I would prefer to pick my spots carefully as opposed to stick to one market. But so far, it just retraced up to this overhead supply. I think it's in trouble. Long or short, it would be a short, but I would not take it as an individual. I would not take it as a setup. I suppose I can't attend this webinar and let you shake me off, at least a single stock pick. So let's look at HPR's breakout trigger. All right, HPR. Yeah, this looks pretty good, actually. Um, where would it break out? Where would the breakout trigger be? Well, if you're trading the little five day uh, moving average pattern that's on my website, and this will all be in a learning management system, which is pretty exciting. I'm such a nerd. Well, the first rule of IPOs, if you watch some of these videos, and I'll have these videos up hopefully soon. I'm having trouble editing. Anybody knows how to get rid of codecs or whatever? Shoot me an email on the side. I, I've tried Handbrake, and that works sometimes. But if you have a better way, let me know. But notice that the high was set on the first day of trading for the first week of trading. Okay. So we now have two rules. It not only has to close at a new high, it also has to close above that high. So if we put in that line, if I can get it to draw. So the first day, well, actually, the buy would have been yesterday on that pattern. And the buy at B, the new closing high pattern, would have been long on this day. So there's two different system here, systems here. One is the new closing high system, and one is the moving average breakout system. So what I would do now is, if you didn't play the breakout on this one, is wait for the next pullback. But yeah, put that on your watch list. A good, uh, good eye. Yeah, please bring those up in the future. Don't worry about that. Tesla recovered. HPR recovered. EWC is going to be an ETF. That's what the Canada Fund, eh? You know how they name Canada, right? They they couldn't come up with a name, and they put a box full of letters. They pulled out a C and everybody went, ah, and then they pulled out an N and everyone went, ah, and they pulled out a D and everybody went, ah, I bet you didn't know that. Um, it looks like it's in trouble. I wouldn't rush out and short it, but yeah, it stalled at the top of this little range, and then it does have a lot of trading above that range, so it's got its work cut out for it. I think it's in trouble. I would not get excited about Canada, A, eh, until it made new highs. WFC. Uh, it's obviously in a downtrend. If you're going to short the banks, find a bank that hasn't broken down just yet. Let me just show you something. Let's, this is a money center. Let me just jump to the sub industry here. And then let's let me show you what I mean by something that hasn't broken down yet. Are there a lot of these? Yeah, that's quite a bit of these. Let's take a look at the overall sector itself. Notice the overall banking sector is just in the early phases of breaking down from pretty high levels. Okay. So find something that looks more like that. Something that's breaking down from high levels as opposed to something that has already broken down. Now, there's not a whole lot that are set up because they've been choppy lately, but JP Morgan comes to mind. It's one I've been watching as a potential short. Uh, Bank of America would still come up at high levels. So as you go through these, you can see, you notice your pick was, was already beaten up and broken down. So find something that's at a higher level, just being in a breakdown. Look for that bow tie or first thrust pattern as opposed to something that's already broken down. Okay, I entered EL at 151.81 above the TKO high, HPR. Uh, EL, okay, EL. 
Yeah, now this it really isn't much of a TKO. It's an okay TKO. Uh, it's not a huge TKO though. Remember, it's based on the the volatility of the market. I mean, it's okay. It's not bad. And it does. I know I preach. It's got to stick out like a sore thumb, but it's not a huge TKO relative to the stock. Also, look at the stock's HV. It's only 20. So this looks like this massive move in here, but this is only 10 points move and. So it's hard for me to get excited about something like this. Uh, but I hear you. Uh, it's in the spirit of a TKO, but it's just not something I would go after. Spot. Yeah, this is Spotify. What did it do in the first day? It made its all-time high for the first week. So there's nothing, absolutely nothing to do with this stock unless it starts making new highs. Okay. And uh, I have a rule that with the buy at B, I don't buy at B if it's more than $20 a share. So I would use the IPO little five-day day light system for that and only buy if it got above this high. We may have seen the high in this. Just like remember, uh, what was that one, Snapchat? Remember, that one hit its, made its all-time high on day one. And it's pretty much imploded ever since. Yeah, you had the big gap up there, but that wouldn't have been tradable anyway. Okay. DNR. Uh, and that looks like a nice big fat bottom. That looks good. Somebody in chat used to call those a J-Lo bottom. I guess they call it a Kim Kardashian bottom. It looks okay. I mean, it's rallying up in here. Put it on your watch list. Maybe on a pullback, except that... It does have a lot of overhead supply. So try to find an energy without so much overhead supply. The symbol I. I don't know this stock. I used to know this stock. It's a foreign stock. HV is a little high, 109. A little crazy on the HV. Uh, but it looks interesting. I hear you. It's going to have to have a pretty deep pullback. I get a little leery and scared when that HV is that high. But, yeah, on a pullback, maybe. I'll give that one a, a strong maybe. Cisco, I'm not going to probably like. It's too thick, unless it's a short. I will short a thick stock. Yeah, I wouldn't get too – Cisco looks sort of like the gatekeeper pattern I talk about on occasion. It looks like, if anything, it's more of a short. But keep in mind, the gatekeeper is the closest thing to a reversal pattern that I'll trade. But I would pass, unless it made a big rollover or a bow tie, okay? LVS, what's that? Uh, something Vegas. Yeah, this is too choppy and sideways. Okay, draw your arrow. Nothing to do there. PXD is going to be an energy stock. Pioneer. Okay, it's making new highs. I'd like to see it clear these prior highs decisively before getting too, too excited. And then even maybe clear these highs. So maybe it's got to get, let it get above 200, see what it does. But it's kind of wide and loose and all over the place. EMPH, I sort of like. But it's too many days in the pullback. It's just pulled back quite a bit. I mean, it still looks okay. This is one that's been on my Landry list for quite a while, and it recently came off. Doesn't mean that it uh, can't still go higher. It's still, but it doesn't. No, it no longer fits the core methodology. But I hear you. It looks okay. UNT HPR recovered already. And I'll get this uploaded so you can look at the. No, this is kind of all over the place. Uh, it's had a pretty decent rally here, but electrocardiogram. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. Jackie Mason stock. XON, 1932. Uh, no, too much overhead resistance, okay? Uh, let's back the chart out a little bit. Yeah, it's just got too much overhead resistance. It's going to have a hard time getting through all this trading. Remember, everything has a psychological backing to it. TMWUF. I don't know if I can... Plot that one. It sounds like he's saying something nasty to me. T W M U M J F. Oh, T W M J F. No, that is that a mutual fund or something? T W M is a uh, ultra short. Be careful with these uh, leverage things or short ETFs because most of the time, one day I'm gonna start a hedge fund and all we're gonna do is we're gonna short the short. ETFs because they have a decay about them. ANF triggered yesterday. Did I make the right decision? Yeah, I think uh, Daphne, I think you're. Um, 
I think you're trading too much, okay? Um, first of all, retail's not doing too good, okay? So it's going to have to be one good-looking stock for me to get excited about it. This one's okay. It's accelerated higher, but this is not enough of a knockout move, and I see your problem. You're, you're not taking the big – it has to stick out like a sore thumb when it comes to TKO. So I would this thing would have to pull back significantly – to make a TKO, a decent TKO, maybe down towards 26. And then anything further would be maybe too far. So it's a fine line on this one. But yeah, you might be over trading a little bit given the nature of the market. Don't want to beat you up too much. Now, this one looks like it's in trouble, okay? This looks like a pioneer type of setup. It's not coming off of all time highs, but multi year highs. Um, I think it's a little too volatile and dangerous to short. But, yes, this is what I call a reversal gap strategy. You make a new high. You have a gap down right afterwards or within 10 days of that high, and then it pulls back a little bit. So long or short, short. If I had to trade this stock, I would short this stock, but I don't have to trade it. So I'm going to pass based on the volatility, and I just wouldn't rush out and, and, and short anything that volatile right now. I'd be more excited about shorting a financial or a bank or something. But eventually, I might get around to shorting some technology. Yeah, the SH, HL, this is one that I've been looking at. Uh, this one comes back from the dead every now and then. It is, let's, let's take a look at the bow ties. It has bow tied, and it has pulled back a little bit. So technically, this is a long... Um, and I almost mentioned it or recommended in a trading service last night, except that it's got a lot of overhead supply to get through. So you're you're dead on on that one. You're awesome in your pick. So you, you're getting it. You're getting there. You're, you're learning really fast. Unfortunately, I just don't like the overhead supply. So that's why I would pass on that one. SPWR. I'm going to have to wrap it up in just a second based on the time here. The software, uh, I get nervous anytime I go over an hour and a half with recording. Uh, this one's just kind of waking up. It does have a lot of overhead supply, but that's a ways away. Uh, maybe, eventually. But it's going to have to maybe take out 11 before I get excited about it. It's kind of wide and loose and all over the place. That's a blast from the past. That was a good one years ago. All right, last one, TNDM. TNDM. Uh... Well, this craziness back here has me a little concerned. And notice it didn't really get too far past this high. Notice the HV is up towards 100. It's just a little too crazy, believe it or not, even even by my standards. So I would pass on that one. Well, look, I'm over time here. As usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. Any unanswered questions, easy for me to say. Shoot me an email at daviddavelander.com. If we don't talk to you now and then, Everyone have a fantastic weekend, and hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.